Will you tell these fools I'm not crazy? Make them listen to me before it's too late! Listen to me. Please, listen. If you don't, if you won't, if you fail to understand, then the same incredible terror that's menacing me will strike at you! I am Rob Word, the host of a series of YouTube interviews called A Word on Westerns. Today we're going to do a show that's a little bit different than the type that we've been doing for the past seven years. Instead of an interview, I'll be talking about films that I think we might want to watch. Because we're dealing with the coronavirus, a lot of us are trapped inside trying to maintain safety, washing our hands, and a distance from people. In fact, we're supposed to be six to eight feet away from everyone that we come into contact with. That's how far my cameraman is right now. As I was going through the list of my films, the catalog on DVDs, Blu-rays, and even VHS, it occurred to me that let's pick some films that maybe dealt with a virus, a pandemic. We get enough of that on the news, but let's watch some Hollywood films because usually they have a happy ending. Let's get to some of the films, okay? I know you're inside. Let's stay inside. Let's be safe. Let's continue to wash our hands as we talk about films that are not westerns, but we're going to call this episode A Word on Pandemic Panic in the Movies. Of the many guests who have appeared with me on A Word on Westerns, we've rarely varied the topic to discuss their work in non-western films. However, there were exceptions, and one of our guests comes immediately to mind. It's Paul Coslow. The late actor was both talented and popular. Besides his westerns, Paul worked in many genres, including science fiction in 1971's The Omega Man, starring Charlton Heston. Mad bomber himself. And I see you got a mad scientist. You know me? And about your work. My work? Incremental effects, countermeasures to toxic agents and liquid systems delivery, microbiological letters, January 1975, remember? You know what it means? I was a med school senior when they scratched the world. The film was based on Richard Matheson's novel, I Am Legend. Paul joined us at the Autry to talk about his westerns, Rooster Codburn and Joe Kidd, but I couldn't help mentioning the Omega Man, and Paul, very briefly, talked about it. In the film, Heston is the lone survivor of a plague, fighting a group of infected zombie-like creatures while also attempting to create a cure for the disease that has wiped out most of the human race. Mr. Heston was so busy that when, when I did my scenes with him, um, the script girl would hold a mop, like a little higher, the same height as Chuck Heston. So I did all my close-ups to the mop and she would read. <laughs> In those days, you know, we were so enamored of Charlton Heston because he had a cell phone and the cell phone was like the size of a battery, you know? And he had a guy carry it because, you know, you're walking around like this. And he, he would just give him the, and he was talking to, uh, you know, Reagan all the time. Um, because he, uh, Chuck was head of the Screen Actors Guild and Reagan was the governor. Um, but, but Charlton Heston was, I really, I really enjoyed him. Um, he, I mean, I didn't really enjoy his politics that much, but I really enjoyed his personality. Um, he was like a straight shooter and he, he really cared, you know, he was interested in, in, in what you had to say. Heston wasn't the first or only version of Matheson's I Am Legend to come to the screen. Vincent Price starred in an earlier European version in 1964. Titled The Last Man on Earth, Price is essentially a vampire hunter. The latest version of the novel in 2007 was actually called I Am Legend. It featured Will Smith as the plague survivor hunting the infected, now transformed into monsters, while struggling to find a cure for the contagious disease. Author Matheson is most known for his work in the science fiction and fantasy world, but his early writing includes teleplays for TV westerns. If you're a fan of Cheyenne, Lawman, Have Gun, Will Travel, or Wanted Dead or Alive like I am, you've probably seen some of the episodes he wrote. Richard Woodmark starred in one of Hollywood's first films to tackle a pandemic, 
directed by Elia Kazan 70 years ago. Panic in the Streets is a frightening thriller with a ticking clock that is even more timely today than when it was made. Cast as a doctor with the U.S. Public Health Service, Woodmark is brought in to diagnose a corpse with a gunshot wound and learns the dead man was an illegal immigrant. Woodmark soon discovers that the dead man was the carrier of an infectious disease, the bubonic plague. Authorities are skeptic. No one knows the dead man's identity or how to track his movements to stop the uncontrolled spread of the deadly virus. Officials don't want to panic the public and suppress the information. But there are only 48 hours before the disease begins to spread throughout the city and beyond. Set in New Orleans and shot on location documentary style, this thrilling movie is filled with grit, realism, and a palpable urgency. In addition to Widmark's fine performance as the voice of reason, the film also features top supporting work from Paul Douglas, Jack Palance, Zero Mostel, and Barbara Bel Geddes as Widmark's wife. If you've never seen this movie, it should go to the top of your pandemic panic viewing list. We've talked about actor Richard Widmark several times on our show, with people who knew and worked with him. William Wellman Jr. recalled as a teenager meeting the actor on location in Lone Pine during the production of his director father's western, Yellow Sky. And actor Michael McGreevy joined us to share stories of working with Widmark in two westerns, The Way West and Death of a Gunfighter. Even Don Siegel's 1956 paranoid classic Invasion of the Body Snatchers could be seen as an allegory of an infected populace. In the film, ordinary citizens are being infected by aliens, first becoming seed pods and then turning into mindless empty vessels. Even if it's not really about a virus, it's certainly worth re-watching star Kevin McCarthy in his most famous role as the voice of reason trying to convince unbelieving people that they should be afraid. Director John Sturgis dipped his megaphone into the virus genre too with 1965's The Satan Bug. Well known for his action films like Bad Day at Black Rock, The Gunfight at the OK Corral, The Magnificent Seven and The Great Escape, Sturgis cast Route 66 star George Maharis as a government agent tracking vials filled with deadly germs created during the Cold War. That I think the Satan bug is one of the most suspenseful and exciting pictures I've ever seen. But don't take my word for it. You see it. I have seen and can recommend Contagion. There is no timelier a movie for today than Steven Soderbergh's film of a fast-moving, seemingly unstoppable virus. The film does not have a typical storyline, but it's loaded with stars. Matt Damon, Gwyneth Paltrow, John Hawks, Jude Law, Lawrence Fishburne, Brian Cranston, Elliot Gould, and others come and go in non-lead roles. Contagion also has parallels with our current race to stop, or at least slow down, the coronavirus. In the film, even though people are dying from an unknown flu-like infection, it takes days before the severity of the deadly virus is realized. This being a movie, things do happen quickly, much faster than our own current situation. The cast is given a timely script by Scott Z. Burns, solid production values, and as usual, camera work done by the director, Soderbergh. To the inner circle of power in Washington. Another big budgeted disease movie to check out is the appropriately titled Outbreak. From 1995, Dustin Hoffman is an army doctor who lobbies his superiors in the government to investigate a disease discovered in Africa. His boss, Chief Officer Morgan Freeman, tells him not to panic and then denies his request because the virus is too far away to be of any concern to America. When an infected monkey is brought into the U.S. and released, things begin to turn deadly. Very compelling so far, 
But the movie loses its way in the second half as Hoffman, without government support, turns into a one-man savior. Still, with Hoffman, Freeman, Rene Russo, Donald Sutherland, Cuba Gooding Jr. and others, it's well worth watching. Perhaps my favorite of all the pandemic films are 28 Days Later and its sequel, 28 Weeks Later. We, the audience, see what is causing the virus, a virus that creates rage in all those infected. 28 Days Later begins in London with well-intentioned animal activists breaking into a scientific laboratory to release chimpanzees that are being used in experiments. Turns out, the chimpanzees are carriers. The real story begins, well, 28 days later, when our hero, Cillian Murphy, wakes up in a deserted hospital. Venturing outside, he finds that London is deserted too, almost completely. However, there are hordes of infected humans who are really, really angry and are killing anyone they can find who is still alive. Of course, zombies are used as an allegory in films, and especially TV with The Walking Dead. Diseased hordes of humanity turning dark and deadly with survivors banding together to fight off the infection any way they can. Maybe the best of the movies is George Romero's influential horror classic, The Night of the Living Dead in 1968. The movie tells the tale of an unexplained breed of tainted humans turned into flesh eaters. They are on a killing rampage. Each time a victim is bitten, the victim becomes infected too, joining the quest for more living flesh. The diverse group of characters trying to escape the plague are gathered in a home, insulated for protection from the virus. Sound familiar? It's very, very scary and deserves its classic status. Shot with a news crew in 16 millimeter using black and white film and cast with locals, Night of the Living Dead can be seen as both a horror masterpiece and an unsettling allegory for our current dilemma. A couple of years later, Romero made an even more frightening allegory called The Crazies. It's a no-name, no-budget film about a virus called Trixie that was developed as a chemical weapon by the government. Trixie turns people into bloody psychopaths. When the chemical is accidentally released, mass hysteria results, and it's hard to tell who is infected and who is not. Yep, that's the very timely plot, and it probably is way too bloody for most viewers. Brad Pitt and his family are put at risk in World War Z. Based on the best-selling novel by Max Brooks, the United Nations worker Pitt is called back to duty to investigate a mysterious virus that is creating a worldwide crisis. When ordinary citizens become infected, they turn into hordes of blood-lusting creatures. Can Brad save his family and mankind? Well, his family anyway. Vampire or even werewolf movies can be seen as films in which close contact and a bite can turn a normal person into an infected creature searching for a cure. Have you seen Universal's 1935 Werewolf of London in which Henry Hall's kindly doctor was bitten by Warner Oland? Well, that bite turned Hall into a flesh-eating werewolf. The only cure was the rare Marifasa plant that bloomed only under moonlight and was fought over by Hall and Oland, both infected. I warn you, sir, unless you secure this plant, there'll be an epidemic that will turn London into a shambles. Did the cure save them? You'll have to add this film to your list and watch it to find out. You might also add to your screening list the same studio's 1941 horror masterpiece, The Wolfman, starring Lon Chaney Jr. in his career-defining role as the bitten, infected Larry Talbot. Do you remember who bit him in the film and transformed the lycanthropic disease? It was none other than Bela Lugosi, Dracula himself, this time playing an infected gypsy. Speaking of Dracula, 
He's another character not adhering to the six-foot distance rule, spreading disease with extremely close contact, and a kiss on the neck that transfers tainted blood, thus creating yet another variation of contagious diseases. Lugosi's pretty much bloodless portrayal pales when compares to British actor Christopher Lee's typecasting interpretation in a series of color movies made for Hammer Films. Lee's glee at first enticing, then infecting nubile young actresses in blood-splattering films with titles like Taste the Blood of Dracula, Dracula Has Risen from the Grave, and The Satanic Rites of Dracula gave the Count a global presence that is yet to subside. Of course, if you decide that these pandemic films are too intense for you, check out our interviews on A Word on Westerns. We have over 300 episodes up, interviews with people who I love, Western actors, actresses, and filmmakers. I think you'll like them too. Thanks again for watching, and let's try to flatten out this curve and be safe out there. See you next time.